Welcome, everyone. I'm Jocelyn Clark, international editor of the BMJ, and I've de I'm delighted that you've joined us today to launch and discuss the BMJ series on Canada's COVID-19 response, which was published last night. Our hosts are the Royal Society of Canada, and we thank them very much for bringing us all together today and for being such a great team to work with. I'd like to start our event today by acknowledging that the RSC offices are located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. From coast to coast to coast, we are grateful to acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the Inuit First Nations and Métis peoples and recognize the dozens of languages and cultures Indigenous peoples have brought that enrich what many call Turtle Island. Since some of us will be participating today from outside Canada, I ask you to also reflect on the territory from which you are joining us and express thanks to those who are the original owners and caretakers of the land. Thank you. So again, I wanna very much um, thank our host, the Royal Society of Canada. For those of you who don't know, Canada's National Academy, the Royal Society of Canada, recognizes the country's leading intellectuals, scholars, researchers, and artists, and mobilizes them to open discussion and debate, to advance knowledge, encourage integrated interdisciplinary understandings, and address issues that are critical to Canada and, and Canadians. I'm really pleased to be moderating this event and to be joined by some of the authors of the BMJ series. They include Drs. Sharon Strauss, Sharmitsa Mishra, Adam Houston, and Ms. Linda Wilhelm. So lots of people have been asking me, why did we do a series on Canada in the BMJ? And in fact, the idea originally came from Dr. Sharon Strauss, who about 10 months ago, I was having a very COVID conversation with. That is, we were sitting outside a coffee shop in Toronto, we were socially distanced, and we were talking to each other, reflecting about our lives and our work over the previous two and a half years of the pandemic. And we recognized that in many ways, Canada had done pretty well so far in the pandemic. But we discussed how underneath that general impression of satisfaction, there were areas that really needed more digging into to examine some spaces where things hadn't gone well during the pandemic, where opportunities or needs were overlooked, where leadership or decisions failed, and where improvements could be made to strengthen crisis response and the health systems in Canada for the future. So she asked me, did I think the BMJ would be interested in publishing some in-depth analyses about Canada? I'm Canadian, so of course I was very interested. I took those ideas back to the BMJ team here in London and they were also really keen. We're an international journal. We knew both our international readers would be interested in hearing how Canada developed and delivered its pandemic response, but we also wanted to contribute to the conversations in Canada among our Canadian readers. And we had also done a successful and very strong series of articles that examined the UK COVID response about a year ago. And so we decided to model this Canada series after that one. I then commissioned those articles and I added a global paper that Adam's gonna tell us about today. And both Sharon and Adam went away and put together really strong and terrific author teams. They come from all parts of Canada and they're across many different disciplines. All of the papers in this series were externally peer reviewed and they were revised and revised and I think maybe even revised for a third time. Um, and, and, and they came together really, really well. Following acceptance of the four core papers, two editorials were written that reflect on and put the series findings in perspective. And in addition to that, we have an opinion piece that describes a unique pandemic management strategy that had been developed in a First Nations community in Manitoba. All of these papers are freely available on bmj.com.
for you to share and comment on and read. We really hope that you'll share them with uh, your networks. And the URL that collects all those papers together, I think it's in the chat, is bmj.com um, hyphen, or no, sorry, slash Canada hyphen COVID hyphen series. bmj.com slash Canada hyphen COVID hyphen series. I wanna thank for sure everyone, all of my colleagues at the BMJ, especially my boss, Cameron Abassi, the editor in chief, but everyone on the team who worked really hard to make these papers as strong and, ex and as accessible as they are. I want to thank the peer reviewers who really helped strengthen these papers, most of whom were top Canadian experts. Of course, our greatest credits and thanks go to the authors who put in so much time and commitment. We're really proud of this series and our aim as a journal is to inform and advance the conversation in Canada and abroad. What lessons can be drawn from Canada's pandemic response? What actions need to be taken in the country? And what can others learn from you? And how can future health preparedness be improved? So thank you very much. I would love to introduce you to our first speaker. It's Dr. Sharmista Mizra. She is the um, she is an infectious disease epidemiologist and physician at the University of Toronto and University uh, Unity Health Toronto. Over to you. Thank you. So 52,750 deaths. A review would summarize what happened and has done. An independent public inquiry could systematically and with scientific humility get at why. And getting at the why in a nuanced way has to come with transformative action, implementation, but we would also contend it must also come with evaluations of the changes that are being made or that have been made because we are going to be tested again. Our pandemic response had many layers interwoven within this complex system of various players making recommendations and where within this system research, evidence, advice, recommendations were being channeled and used. Who was making the decisions and who was implementing the programs and importantly, for whom were these policies and programs being designed and implemented? Whom do they benefit? Ultimately, who and what part of this complex system within which research is embedded was accountable for the systemic and structural pathways that led to over 52,000 deaths and disproportionately among persons experiencing social and economic marginalization. There have been inquiries and reports before. It can be re-examined looking at the lens of the last two to three years. To what extent was there clarity and roles and responsibilities and coordination of decision-making that contributed to the pandemic impact and what were and the solutions to data deficiencies inconsistencies in the sharing of the data that may have hampered public health responses. What have not been included in previous inquiries? To what extent was the presence or lack of a pandemic focus on social determinants of health, on social justice, and on differential risks of transmission? And how did that lead to successes or failures to tailor protective measures and contribute to mortality, morbidity, and health inequalities? And importantly, as a research ecosystem, to what extent was our COVID-related research on health inequalities laid to the policymaking tables ignored and or missing? And how did, that, how did that influence our pandemic policies? To what extent were patients and communities engaged in the research and the research use and in the development of science advice that would be inclusive of diverse scholarly voices and diverse voices and lived experience across the development of research all the way through its action and into policy and public health decision making. We contend that a systematic inquiry drawing on rigor across scholarly domains and on communities and lived experience does mean action to do better across public health and the health system and also in how we do pandemic research. In summary, we don't think that the status quo is inevitable. Thanks. 
Thank you. Thank you, Sharmissa, for that summary of, of your paper. And um, we appreciate that very much. We're going to, before we take questions for each um, panelist, we're going to move on to our next speaker. And I'm pleased to introduce to you um, Ms. Linda Wilhelm. She's the president of the Canadian Arthritis Patient Alliance, which is a virtual grassroots, patient-driven, independent, national organization with members across Canada. So over to you, Linda. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, living with uh, incurable, severely disabling disease uh, is, not, is a very scary thing, but living with the same disease during a global pandemic was terrifying. It was very scary for many people in my community. I have rheumatoid arthritis, I'm immunocompromised. Uh, early on the pandemic, we were getting information out thrown at us just, you know, kind of every day something new and it was changing and shifting. And, you know, we had the US president come on and say, oh, everybody should be taking hydroxychloroquine. Uh, not even thinking about the consequences of that when all of a sudden all that uh, jurisdiction started diverting supply uh, and wouldn't give people with rheumatic diseases and people with lupus uh, hydroxychloroquine is one of their only treatments options. They were diverting supply and denying access to people who have been on this medication very successfully for many years uh, for something that was didn't have any evidence behind it. Uh, so I guess that was our first uh, uh, realization that maybe we weren't all in this together and that some of us were really going to be left behind or going to have to struggle. Uh, and then we saw the vaccine roll out. Uh, and again, we were receiving conflicting information. Uh, the UK was coming out saying people who are immunocompromised need to be a priority population with people 80 plus. Uh, we saw the NASI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization in Canada, uh, come out that recommending that, that people who are immunocompromised not get vaccinated. Uh, and here we were in isolation for over a year, afraid to go out wondering what COVID would do if we ended up catching it uh, with our already compromised immune systems. Uh, so that was the beginning of our many uh, uh, letters that we wrote to NASI trying to get clarification, trying to get information. We were very lucky. We had a very strong, productive re relationship with our clinician researchers. Uh, so we reached out to them and our first endeavor was something very basic. It was a form letter that could go on the Canadian Rheumatology Association's website that uh, a rheumatologist could print off and sign that said that patient was immunocompromised. Because when we were showing up when the vaccines came out, uh, we were the recommendations were not getting through. They weren't getting updated. And we, were, we were being denied when NASA ultimately did change their recommendation. Uh, we were still being denied because of the former recommendation and the key lack of communication. So we, we would go and get that letter done. And, so patients could now print that off and, and have it. I used it for my son's school. Uh, so I wouldn't, he would have for child custody case where I couldn't have the kids while they were at home school because of my immunocompromise being immunocompromised. The next thing we did was uh, we reached out to them about the confusion about the vaccines and what patients, everybody going to a different jurisdiction was receiving different instructions. And so we came up with and worked with them on a decision tool to try to help patients. And uh, throughout the uh, pandemic, as, as evidence was evolving, we were doing webinars for our patients because frankly, the government wasn't there for us. And, you know, now, you know, everybody's, you know, declared the pandemic's over. They're all moving on. But our patient population can't move on. We're still uncertain. I had my sixth booster three months ago. Uh, about a week after that, I developed the bad RA flare that's been very challenging and difficult to manage. I don't know, is it caused by six boosters? Should I have had six boosters? Maybe I didn't need that sixth one. What is the timing on this? We don't have any of this information in Patients are, need to start making some more decisions. And I tell you, even now, you know, we're hearing, you know, people are not masking anymore. So we still have to, as you know, compromised patients, we have to mask. We still have to do all the protections. But again, uh, we're not all in this together. Uh, so we're, I'm hoping through this series that maybe we'll have some more attention and maybe we'll start having some uh, protections in for people who are more vulnerable and isolated. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thanks for sharing your story. I'd like to go next to um, Sharon Strauss, um, who is a geriatrician and clinical epidemiologist 
She is at um, St. Michael's Hospital where she's physician in chief and also director of the Knowledge Translation Program. And I wonder, Sharon, if you might, just before you start um, summarizing the, the paper that you led on about um, Canada's long-term care setting, I wonder if you might, for our audience, just give, uh, give us a few minutes or a, a couple of minutes describing how you came up with the topics that you pitched to the BMJ to focus on for the series and how you kind of brought together all the ideas and all the, the authors for those first three papers that look specifically at the domestic response within the country. So, so thanks so much, Jocelyn. And, and before I speak to that, I do want to acknowledge and thank Jocelyn for her incredible leadership and, uh, and for everybody at the BMJ and for making sure that the articles are publicly in, uh, available. I think that's a, a really important commitment from the BMJ and so wanted to thank them. Also, thank you to the Royal Society for, for hosting us today. And, um, and it's interesting because as Jocelyn said, this started like almost 10 months ago um, when, when we met and we're, we're chatting about kind of our, our COVID experiences. And, you know, I, I often feel like I, I'm incredibly privileged to, to do the kinds of work that I do, that I'm a, I'm a clinician and, you know, I'm a researcher and, and I'm also um, play a medical a leadership role in, in, our, in our hospital. And it's given me kind of different perspectives on things during the pandemic, everything from, you know, Sharmista and I worked together and, and I was amazingly privileged to have Sharmista do modeling for us that informed our COVID inpatient units here at St. Mike's. So we knew exactly how to, you know, how to create our, our COVID inpatient units and what our workforce should look like. Um, but it also gave an interesting lens that Sharmista and I talked about a lot over the last three years around how, you know, there were there were challenges that that we that we saw that we saw unfold, um, not just locally but provincially and nationally and internationally, and how we were fortunate as researchers that um, we could answer some of these questions, we could kind of tackle some of these things, but that there were certain things that you know, that we, we didn't feel that we had the, the skills to, to do. And, and so when, when Jocelyn and I kind of sat down and had, had that, that coffee, it was, you know, appropriately distanced, um, we, we talked about some of these things, some of the things that, you know, unfolded during the pandemic, some of the great things that happened, like our vaccine rollout, um, you know, to long-term care, that long-term care was prioritized, you know, it was fantastic and, and saved lives. Uh, but what were the areas where maybe it didn't, we didn't do so well and that we could learn from? And, you know, we, we have a rich tradition, I think, in, in academia and clinical medicine and research to always kind of reflect back and, and to question. And, you know, when Charmista spoke about humility, we talked about clinical humility and scientific humility, that we want to learn from what's gone on before to inform us for the future, to figure out how can we use this knowledge to, to move forward. And so that was really the kernel of, of what we talked about and, um, and identified kind of these key areas. And what were the common themes? You know, what, what we saw unfold in long-term care? What were the challenges around data and lack of data and um, you know, inability to, to access data? And, um, and the role that research played and that it could have played even a stronger role. And the role that researchers could have played, um, you know, and, and, and under kind of underscoring all of that and cross cutting that was, you know, the two themes really, I think around fragmentation and around health inequities. Uh, and, you know, as, as Sharmista mentioned that these weren't kind of themes of previous inquiries and especially around the, the, the focus on inequities. And so we really wanted to, to address these. And so I feel incredibly fortunate to have been able to work with an amazing group of authors from coast to coast in, in Canada, representing very different disciplines who brought together this, this series. And, um, and really, as Jocelyn said, it's really a, you know, a start of the reflective period, but also what we wanna see in a national inquiry is the implementation and the action, um, and that there's accountability for the actions as well. And so with that as, as background, I'll speak briefly then to the, to the long-term care uh, paper that, that we wrote as part of this series. And I wanted to acknowledge the amazing staff in the long-term care, the managers in the long-term care, the residents in the long-term care who pushed for, for this work and who really led to, um, led to this work. And really it's about, you know, as, as somebody, um, a couple of people have said to me in response to this series is that, you know, they, they see this window closing 
and you know, yes, people want to move on. As Linda said, like people, for many people, you know, they want to return to pre-COVID normal, um, but for many people, they can't. And um, and so we worry that the window is closing on the opportunity to really reflect on on what happened during COVID. And if we think about what happened in long-term care, more than 14,000 lives were, were lost in, in long-term care. And it's thinking about how can we address that? How can we prevent that from happening again in the next public health emergency? And as we spoke about in, in the paper that you know, there've been lots and lots of reports done in the decades prior to COVID, you know, basically predicting this and, uh, and and highlighting the challenges in in long term care, the chronic underfunding, you know, the insufficient support for staff, you know, the, the lack of recognition of the complexity of the the population living in in, in long term care, and you know the, the the not just the medical complexity, the social complexity, and so all of these factors. And then adding COVID on top of this led to this kind of perfect storm of uh, what we saw in long-term care. And I think that we owe those individuals um, in long-term care to say that you know, we will do better in future and that we will create transformative change. So it's not just about coming up with a list of recommendations, but it's coming up with informative change and transformative change. And a couple of things I, I wanted in particular to, to reflect on is that if we think in particular about, about the staff, we could have talked about a lot of different things in the long-term care home sector, but we, we in particular wanted to, to address um, what's been happening on the staffing front and really trying to advocate for, for better support for the staff within that sector. And one of the things that um, that the research has shown, and, and Charmista has actually led on, on this research, is that compared with other healthcare workers, that the staff in the long-term care who had COVID were more likely to live in lower income neighbors, neighborhoods with higher density and live with other essential service workers. And throughout each wave of the pandemic of COVID, that these low wage essential workers were at highest risk of burden from COVID. So they paid that biggest price in terms of COVID morbidity and mortality with each wave of the pandemic. So this wasn't just at the beginning, but it was at each wave of the pandemic. And I think that we owe all of these individuals to do better the next time. And so a national inquir inquiry would, would not just allow us to, to reflect, but to come up with explicit recommendations. And in our papers, we, you know, we pose a whole bunch of questions that, that could be asked, thinking about everything from you know, were the, 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 the staff in long-term care, were the residents, were their essential care partners involved in the, in the response and the recommendations that, that came forward, whether it was at the provincial level or the local level? What was the impact of not including them in that? What was the impact of some of our, of some of our policies, policies, the lack of access to sick pay, for example, at the very beginning of the, of the pandemic? You know, the, the lack of access to data across the country. That was, again, one of our one of the themes that we didn't have data to inform some of our recommendations. And so then we couldn't actually provide the policymakers with the information that they that they needed to, to really make accurate decisions and, 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 and hear kind of the recommendations that they needed. And ideally, what we want to see is that the inquiry would not just come up with the recommendations, but would come up with an actionable plan and using in particular for the long-term care home sector that using the Canada Health Act to come up with a national public plan for long-term care where there's a link between federal funding and evidence-based outcomes that the provinces, territories and long-term care homes are accountable for. And that this is something that would actually create transformative change. This isn't, this isn't something where it's just a list of recommendations we're really asking for transformative change because we believe that we all owe this to those individuals in long-term care. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Really appreciate that a spotlight on the nursing home um, setting because I, I, I think as I've mentioned in, in other contexts, this is one of the areas of Canada's um, crisis, if you will, that really did um, rise to the attention of an international audience. Um, not least because Canada came out um, with the worst record in long-term care facility deaths, which um, you know obviously is very concerning, and for which your paper makes 
uh, a huge contribution to, to in terms of outlining the kinds of reform that's needed. So I want to introduce our, our fourth speaker, again, um, an international issue that um, rose to the attention of many more people around the world than just Canadians, and that's the topic of global vaccine equity. So I'd like to welcome Adam Houston, who's the Medical Policy and Advocacy Officer for Medicine Sans Frontières. Over to you, Adam. Thank you. Hi. Um, no, thanks very much. Um, I'll echo all the, the thanks that have already been given out to given, uh, given timelines here. Um, so my role, uh, both in this series, in the journal, uh, also in this webinar today, is a bit to highlight that as we reflect on Canada's actions and their repercussions, that those actions and repercussions extend beyond Canada's borders. And we, we really can't forget that, uh, both in you know, in an inquiry and more importantly, in actually acting on these lessons. And this, unfortunately, as I'll come to, is an area where uh, Canada seems to be learning some of the wrong lessons already, and, and hopefully there's time to, to change course. So, you know, the, the first point here, uh, and this kind of relates to, uh, you know, both Canada's role in the world and what Canada wants its role in the world to be, you know, is this issue of, of vaccine. Um, equity and the gulf between uh, the rhetoric and the reality of Canada's actions, right? We've all heard the, the government mantra of, uh, you know, the pandemic is not over anywhere until it's over everywhere. At the same time, uh, you know, in, in reality, what we've seen is Canada's role as a major vaccine hoarder. I mean, this is a country that uh, by late 2020 had secured the most doses uh, per capita of any country in the world of what was in very uh, short supply, right? Uh, over 400 million doses, so uh, more than 10 doses uh, per person from, from 17, or sorry, seven rather uh, different manufacturers. And certainly uh, you know, there are conversations to be had about uh, you know, justifying that particular procurement plan, right? At a, at a time when you know, we didn't know which vaccines, if any, were going to work. What's far, far harder to justify is Canada's strange reticence to actually share any vaccines well after it became readily apparent that Canada was going to have way more vaccines than it needed. You know, Canada began its own domestic rollout in December 2020. Canada didn't even pledge, not deliver, pledge to share any of those uh, vaccines from bilateral contracts until mid-July of 2021. Uh, just about two weeks before uh, Canada itself physically received enough vaccine to fully vaccinate everyone who was then eligible. And Canada's ongoing you know, reticence to share, uh, to its preference for, for keeping vaccines on ice rather than getting them into arms uh, around the world, meant that um, Canada's much trumpeted pledge of uh, donating 200 million doses to COVAX by the end of uh, 2022, um, by the end of 2022, actually only about 26 million doses uh, from the country that had secured the most doses per capita in the world uh, were actual physical doses delivered to COVAX. Uh, meanwhile, at, at home, uh, many doses simply went to waste. The rest of that 200 million ended up being made up of uh, equivalent doses, i.e. cash. And to be clear, Canada, when it came to signing checks, Canada was actually pretty active in, in that regard and, and you know some credit is certainly due there. But you know the impact of these equivalent doses that that itself remains uh, up in the air because at the uh, you know early on in the pandemic, there weren't actually any doses still available for that cash to buy. And by the uh, end of 2022, uh, demand for doses was such that that wasn't really you know what uh, what the world needed at that time. So this leads to another point, which is that Canada's um, approach, and this applies more broadly in global health, Canada's not bad about, again, getting out the checkbook. What Canada really needs to work on is going deeper to actually solve uh, or help solve, show leadership on solving uh, the underlying problems in, in global health. And we really have not seen that. Uh, as an example, you know, Canada has provided funding for the uh, WHO's mRNA technology transfer hub in South Africa. 
great, provided some funding for that. Uh, the irony is that in order to have any technology to transfer, that tech transfer hub actually had to reverse engineer a vaccine because no pharmaceutical company would transfer technology to it. And that includes vaccines that depend upon uh, technology that was developed here in Canada at a publicly funded university. And here is an area where we actually see Canada learning the wrong lessons, actually going, going backwards on uh, equitable access to, to drugs and vaccines worldwide, where um, you know, Canada has really shifted its relationship with the pharmaceutical industry uh, during this pandemic. And you know, we could talk about uh, the TRIPS waiver, we, and we do in the paper, you should read it. Uh, the TRIPS waiver, we could talk about the Patent and Medicine Prices Review Board, um, changes to that here uh, domestically. But a you know, really key example happening right now, right now, uh, is in the negotiations of the pandemic treaty, where Canada is actually pushing uh, for technology transfer you know, in the context of a pandemic, pushing for technology transfer to be solely on uh, voluntary and mutually agreed terms with pharmaceutical companies, with no thought to, well, you know, what happens, as has happened in COVID, as has happened with HIV, so many other things, when pharmaceutical companies don't want to enter into voluntary and mutually agreed terms. Uh, and that applies even when um, though the innovations in question would not exist without very large amounts of public funding. So, and one of the, we talked about a number of things in the paper, public manufacturing and, and so forth, read the paper. Um, but, you know, one of the key points we, we talked about is, right, public funding for, for research. You know, there should be strings tied to that so that public funding for public health research should prioritize benefits to the public. Uh, and not private dividends. Um, so I think uh, I think I'll stop there. Again, uh, read the paper, read all the papers, uh, <laughs> but definitely lessons to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, and I'm we're now we've got time about about twenty or twenty five minutes for questions, and there's lots and lots of questions coming in from the Q and A. So we'll make sure we go through as many as we can. But I'm going to start off um, with you, Adam, if you don't mind, because I actually find your paper with your colleagues really exceptional, really interesting, providing more of an analysis of that story that so many people have heard around the world about Canada being named the world's chief vaccine hoarder for some of the reasons that you mentioned. However, it's also very concerning that so many of the, the, the promises or some of the pledges that you've described aren't really they're not binding in any way. So it allows nations like Canada to escape responsibility for following through on their promises. So my question to you is, um, what are the incentives? Like what needs to happen for that relationship between, let's say domestic health security um, being linked to global health security, being um, more clear, more palatable, to politicians, et cetera. What, what are one or two incentives that have to be in place so that we actually see uh, more, more um, action rather than just promises and pledges? Right, no, that's, that's a, a good question. Um, and you know, we, we do get into that a bit in the, in the, in the paper. Um, you know, I mean, one, one of the incentives in, in a pandemic is you know, something that the government, uh, as, as I noted, repeatedly said, right, the, uh, something like a pandemic is not over, um, you know, in, uh, anywhere until it's over everywhere. And we can, you know, get into the longer conversations about, you know, emergence of variants and, and, and other questions like that. Um, but, you know, Canada, of course, was in an interesting situation here, because, of course, Canada itself hadn't and still has not to this day, actually produced any vaccines, uh, COVID-19 vaccines domestically. So, you know, there's, there's questions there about, you know, how do we prepare, um, you know, and, and, you know, how do we ensure that we have those resources available in the future, right? We, we now have a, a very large public manufacturing facility in Montreal. Uh, it's been, you know, finished construction 2021, um, still hasn't produced anything. Um, but there are very useful things we could be doing 
But the approach right now uh, raises questions. You know, right now it's being uh, rented out to a commercial vaccine company that has not produced anything. Whereas, you know, it's publicly owned facility. Why aren't we using that to highlight Canadian innovations, uh, you know, for, for the global good? There are great things coming out of Canada, things like the Ebola vaccine, but things that don't actually get the support um, that they need because they don't, right, they aren't big money earners. Uh, so great Canadian innovations, there's a gap. Uh, they don't always get to the finish line to get to patients. We have these facilities now. Why aren't we using those to make sure these really important global health innovations get out there? Uh, and really, that's something to stamp Canada's name on, uh, you know, at the, at the end of the day. Thank you. It, it, all, it sort of, it, it touches a theme that I detected throughout the series, which is, um, you know, a basic sort of level of underinvestment in research and innovation in Canada and a kind of chronic um, um, lack of support for, for science and research infrastructure in, in the country, which, you know, puts Canada in a position not to be able to capitalize even when they do have, uh, you know, kind of homegrown discovery that might ha have application within Canada or abroad. So thank you for raising that. Um, Sharon, if you don't mind, I'm going to go to you next because we've got a really good question that I think sort of strikes at the heart of, 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 of much of your work, which is this sort of tension between jurisdictions in Canada, such that federally we have, you know, legislation for a universal health system in, in the form of the Canada Health Act. Federally, we have responsibility for things like public health emergencies, but then a lot of healthcare um, is administered, well, healthcare is administered provincially or territorially, and also the ways that, you know, the different interventions um, mounted in order to deal with a public health emergency are also done either at a provincial, regional, or municipal level. So the question from the audience is, like how, you know, you've identified a lot of fragmentation. What are the better ways to increase coordination between those different jurisdictions and maybe across the different provinces and territories? So, so that's, the, that's kind of the, the, the big question, isn't it? So how do, how do we do better? How do we um, move beyond this fragmented system? And you're absolutely right, because the funding comes from the federal government, gets delivered to the provinces and territories, and that's where healthcare is, is delivered. And, and then with, um, with public health decision making, we have you know, the Public Health Agency of Canada where recommendations can be made, but then you know, in each province and territory, public health is, is kind of managed and, and delivered in different ways. And there might be different recommendations at the provincial territorial level or municipal level. So, so absolutely. So there's potential for you know, competing recommendations or different recommendations at each, at each one of these different levels. And so, so ultimately, like this is why we said it does. It is going to require some, some transformative change, and and more more than you know we have to do better. It's really thinking about how do we make sure that the federal funding is actually tied to outcomes, so important evidence based outcomes that are relevant to the patients, relevant to the public, and um, and that the provinces and territories are accountable for, and that they're held held to this accountability. So. I don't. I don't think that we're going to achieve a lot of a lot of change without making you know a big um, transformative change like that. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, as you say, it's it's sort of the million dollar question, and there is a lot of, I think, important um, analysis within the papers that you and the teams have produced that shed light on how. Um, even outdated systems exist that don't allow for easy or ready collection of data, data that's accessible and shareable across jurisdictions. But also I was very struck by your findings that actually in Canada, we don't have a good culture of data sharing. And that, that's, that seems to me that's one of those elements of transformative change that you keep mentioning, that this is about you know, a t probably a totally different way of, of working together and doing business together. So thank you for that. Um, I want to move to the more of the research side of, of the ledger, because there is a lot of material and findings within the series that examines things like the use of science advice, including um, in, I think, many jurisdictions, definitely in Ontario, I'm familiar with these things called science tables, um, 
which are advisory committees and I think are many times volunteer um, experts, researchers, clinicians, etc. But also your um, your series really looked deeply at how at the beginning of the pandemic, when a lot of research agencies in Canada, but in many countries around the world, pivoted really quickly to rapidly call for and fund different pieces of research to help, you know, quickly um, support uh, the pandemic response. So I'm going to put a couple questions that I'm getting in the Q&A to you, Sharmista, and then you, Linda, if you don't mind. And that is, like, how is it that in a country that is not only um, you know, truly authentically diverse across language, religion, um, certainly geography, um, culture, race and ethnicity, etc. Um, and has an international reputation for valuing multiculturalism. How is it that your findings um, showed that actually some of that early research that was funded and supported um, to help with the pandemic response actually didn't get at some of the inequalities or differences across Canada's population. Can you talk a little bit about that, Sharmista, a little bit more and what you, um, I mean, you raised a lot of questions in your opening remarks, but like what, what, what's it going to take to change so that you have a fully formed um, research response in the future that, you know, is firing on all the cylinders you're asking for? Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, exactly. So I think what we're talking about here is intention versus the systematic structures that actually enable us to ensure that the, the diversity of science is being done that is aligned with the pandemic's needs. So we get an early rapid call for research. So what happens when you get an early rapid call that has no prioritization, that is essentially a uniform call out for, please do early research on anything we might need with the pandemic, we leave behind without actually explicitly naming where we know there's gonna be a concentration of a disproportionate risk. So that was, that took about eight months, eight to 10 months, but that was rectified with future calls. So it's about having that in place anytime we're going to do a rapid response call for research and pandemics, that's one. Two is thinking about the type of science and the type of scholarly work that is needed. Um, we were heavily focused on biomedical, we continue to be. So we yet have another call for a $2.2 billion investment in bio, uh, biomedical research and biomanufacturing innovation research with zero mention of how communities most affected are engaged in that, in Indigenous research, sovereignty within that pillar of funding and research, um, and, uh, and how inequities would be addressed through that mechanism of research. So it really is about what type of research and exactly the questions that our early research funding needs to answer. Um, and it's moving from intention to setting that up from a structure perspective. And so why I think increase can also lead to action is because that's already starting to happen. We are an adaptive country. Um, as a research entity, we are trying to adapt. And so it is about figuring out why that didn't work and then adapting quickly if we can. The second part about the science to advice or the science to action, the research to action and policy, it's really unclear how many of those advisory tables and the science advice um, was shaped and formulated. Who formed those? Who was asked? Who wasn't asked? So what voices uh, were or were not at the tables? How inclusive was that? Um, and those are the systemic practices, once again, that kind of shape what, what, what some of the challenges were. So I think it's about being intentional about not just the specific voices, but also the being accountable to the products of the scientific advice we're putting out. So again, it's great to look back and say, in hindsight, in 2020, we were all about equity. We weren't when you take a look at the reports and the products that we produced in that first year. Um, so moving forward, those are our check boxes. Those are going beyond trying to just embed equity, um, uh, you know, um, yes, no answers, even to this day getting asked. 
to review uh, surveillance documents to check to see if there's an equity lens to it versus being intentional from the start as part of the how we do science to policy advice. So I think that's where none of our inquiries to date have actually put that in place. And I think that is something that um, our, our research agencies and our and user agents can, can, can implement. I hope I answered oh. those two questions, Jocelyn. Yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah. brilliant. I mean, I, I could ask you a million more and mm -hmm. we could spend the rest of the day talking about it, but I really appreciate that. There's another dimension of equity and inclusion um, which is the patient engagement and involvement, Linda. So if I might ask you the next question, and that is, I mean, this is incredibly vital, but can you just tell us briefly from your point of view, to what extent were patient needs and engagement included in Canada's pandemic response? I mean, were, was patient engagement part of Canada's pandemic preparedness plan, for example? And how does that need to improve going forward? Yeah, no, patients were not engaged at all in the early stages of the pandemic. And uh, you know, it, it caused a lot of issues. And I, I mentioned the example of hydroxychloroquine uh, where patients were going to the pharmacy. First of all, you have immunocompromised patients. So they first someplace, some jurisdictions were diverting supplies to hospitals for COVID, even though there was no evidence for this treatment at all. And then telling patients with lupus and RA, sorry, we only have enough for 10 days for you. Come back in 10 days because we're short. And then they would have to go back. So you're exposing these immunocompromised patients to more co-pays. So people who are vulnerable and have to pay out of pocket for their drugs or have to pay co-pays have to pay that more often because they, instead of 90 days, they're getting 10 days every you know, every 10 days, they get 10 more days. Um, and then when we went to government, you know, like the government needs to, to strike some more citizen panels within their ministries of health. We went to government with, uh, you know, our concerns about hydroxychloroquine and they were saying, oh, there's no shortage, there's no problem. Health Canada is saying, well, yeah, there's a shortage. We've got patients emailing us saying, I went to the drugstore today and they told me I couldn't, there was no medication for me. What do I do? Um, you know, it was just, you know, them were clamoring, trying to reach the rheumatologist. So, you know, there's got to be better communication and we've got to do better at engaging patients. And I mean, we really had to battle at Kappa to get nasty and to engage with them. They did respond to all our letters and, you know, thank goodness, because, but, you know, we were, we were, we were asking for clarification on their recommendations, but, you know, it was still, you know, we had to, it was always something we had to do because of something else that happened to us and we had to try to mitigate that damage that was being done to us. So I would say ministries of health going forward need to strike citizen engagement committees or panels to give them advice on patient priorities in healthcare. And I think that's one way we can actually improve the healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. That was very, very, very thoughtful of you to offer that. Um, Sharon, the next question is to you, and again, it's not, it's not the easiest question, but I'm sure there's many people in the audience, um, including myself, who are old enough to remember that um, Canada survived a previous um, SARS outbreak uh, back in 2003, and it, you know the country, particularly um, Toronto, Ontario, was really heavily impacted by that. I think Canada was most impacted out of any country outside of Asia. And it was a really significant time in history. There was also a review done back then. And many of the findings of that review um, actually seem, are, are now being hearkened as we're talking about the findings of, of the four papers in the BMJ series. So how does it happen that this, you know, sort of the fragmentation you've talked about, the, the, the missed opportunities to have a more cohesive or coordinated response to even be better prepared? I, I'm sure readers are astonished to learn from that the conclusion, I believe, of the first paper is that Canada was not prepared for the COVID-19 pandemic. That seems you know, quite astonishing given what had happened 20 years ago. So looking forward from now, how do you expect things to change if not enough had changed from that previous report and, and that experience? 
You know, so so I think that's a it's another great question, and um and I was around in in SARS two thousand and three with my first year one of my first years on faculty, and I was attending actually at UHN in Toronto um the night we got the first call that we were getting um some of the some of the initial patients actually transferred into our CTU. Um, and I and actually that led to uh, um, some work that we did related to, to SARS uh, SARS one, and and in particular people's experiences of, of that, and um, and I think that one of the things that that you know it's it's really caused me to, to reflect on is what responsibility do we all play in this, and that you know we you know, in some ways things change, and in other ways nothing nothing changed. And and I think to say that um, in, we we had the mailer report from from the previous SARS and and yes th some things did get implemented did everything get implemented no it didn't um, but some things did like public health agency like we have a you know provincial public health Ontario so so some some things you know were implemented um, so I don't want us to lose sight of that and and become very nihilistic that well nothing's going to change so why bother you know why bother doing um, doing an inquiry because until we do a national inquiry and ask the questions you know in a very thoughtful rigorous way we're not going to know how to do better the next time and we're not going to be able to to implement anything but I think we have to do better at the implementation and the accountability going forward and I think that's what was missing in the previous reports that you know it's 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 enough to say you know, we've got this list of recommendations, you know, job done, you know, and we all walk away. Well, we're not walking away. We're, we're saying that we, we want to see this being implemented and we want people, you know, we all have, you know, a responsibility to see these things being implemented and that we're accountable for this. And so that's what I would see as, as being one of the, one of the chief differences um, compared to, you know, the, the previous report. And similarly, as, as Sharmista has outlined in her comments as well, that you know, the, the previous report, the, the Naylor report, as well as other reports, didn't didn't you know, really take on this this theme of health inequities to the degree that that we feel is really important to do moving forward. Um, and and I would say that each one of us in Canada has a responsibility to learn from this and to implement and to hold people accountable for for this so that we do better um because i don't think any of us want to be here you know in a similar situation after the next public health emergency where we said well why didn't we you know why didn't we learn from from the previous we owe it to everybody living in canada to you know to those fifty thousand plus people who died to, to to not just have a list of recommendations but to have achievable action Thank you. Thanks. I really appreciate that. And uh, and actually, that's almost a perfect uh, way to end. I may ask just one one final question so that we can wrap up uh, on time and thank all our colleagues. The, the point that I would like to make is from the point of view of the BMJ, we are calling for a national inquiry on Canada's COVID response. We see the contribution of these, you know, four core papers, which are all excellent but nevertheless look in very focused ways on four particular areas that we believe to have a great deal of importance. We're also aware both at the BMJ and among our, our wonderful colleagues who made up um, the, the, the labor that um, produced this series, that there are a number of reviews taking place in Canada on things like long-term care or the, the country's global health role. We recognize those are happening, but we together do not believe that each of those little small pieces do more than kind of create a little bit of a patchwork quilt. So we think that all of these pieces do not amount to enough of a broad, probing, comprehensive, national, public inquiry conducted by independent experts, legislated and go governed by the federal legislation that um, can, you know, encapsulate this type of inquiry so that lessons can be drawn in a very substantive and deep way and can lead to the actions, um, the binding actions even, that you're describing, Sharon. So I really do hope that this is just, you know, as we always say with publication, you know, this is not the end of the story. This is just the beginning. And we're putting these out there. We hope people respond to them, comment on them, critique them, share them, you know, offer us your reaction um, so that we can continue to support uh, 
Canadian efforts and also Canadian Canadian ambition to be a leader in global health. This is something um, that I know we all care about very much, but we're demanding more of, of our government in order to, to achieve that ambition. So with thanks to everyone around the table and just a final, a final thought from you, Sharon, as the, the lead of the author, um, you know, what are you hoping and expecting from this in the next stage? And is there anything else you would like to add to, to my comments to our audience about uh, please to continue to engage with us? Yes, no, just to just to echo your 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 comments, Jocelyn, and, and to really highlight that we see this as a as a positive opportunity for us as a country. You know, I think one of the things that we've all said as we've talked about these these articles over the last few months is that you know we feel grateful to live in Canada. We love our country, we love um, being able to to work together and live together here. And we feel responsibility to make it better for others in the future. And um, and so we see this as our opportunity to make a better future for others. And so um, this, is, this is a real positive opportunity. And so now the, you know, the onus is on us to work together um, collectively across the country to continue to push on a national inquiry, but to, to push for action. So thank you. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you. So it's my um, responsibility to close today's webinar. And I just want to, on behalf of the Royal Society of Canada, the BMJ and myself, I want to thank everyone who joined us. We had a huge response to our webinar. We really appreciate it. I want to thank all the panelists, the authors of the four papers, and all their colleagues who helped make this happen. Please visit the bmj.com to find all the articles in full, which are freely available. As I said, please read them, share them, comment on them. And please join the conversation on Twitter by following at RSC, the academies, and at BMJ underscore latest. And you can get in touch with the RSC to, if you have any other questions, but also to learn about the, the great work that they do. So thank you again to everyone who participated, to our panelists, and also to the team at the RSC for bringing us together. We really appreciate it. All the best. <laughs>